Well, good morning, Walden Church. This is uh, another sermon in our sermon series for the summer that we're calling our Summer Playlist. Pretty much every week, we've just picked a different topic, a different subject. And today, I want to look at a very small portion of a letter in the book of Revelation. And I know traditionally, uh, Revelation is an exciting book. It feels a lot like, you know, we're going into the secret trunk that's in our parents' attic. But in truth, it's more like reading correspondence from the battlefield that's been turned into code so the enemy couldn't read it. In uh, World War II, wireless radio communication was very important for directing military forces that were spread all over the world. But radio messages could be intercepted. So secret plans, information, orders, they had to be transmitted in code. All the major powers used these complex machines that would turn ordinary text into code. For instance, in Germany, they had a machine called Enigma. And in America, we had a machine called Sigaba. And you can actually see both of these machines if you go to the National Cryptology Museum. So the Allies ended up being able to read German messages very early in, in the war. And that was because of Polish and British mathematicians. In the 1930s, Polish codebreakers copied the German Enigma machine with the help of a German trader, and they solved all the letter scrambling problems. They later shared that knowledge with France and Britain, and intelligence from decrypted Enigma machines, and a very few people that knew about it helped to turn the tide in the war. In fact, the Germans never even found out that the Allies could unscramble their codes. And Revelation is written like that. It's a code. Remember, the Bible didn't start off as one book. It was assembled. And so each book of the Bible has its own genre. Poetry, narrative, history, prophecy, correspondence, genealogy, quotation, allegory, and apocalyptic. It's not always straightforward. It's not always literal. And it certainly, right, was not written in English. So Bible study takes work. It's not as simple as a, a Google word search. Revelation is written in apocalyptic writing, which is similar to other books of the Bible like Daniel, um, parts of Isaiah, and some parts of the prophets. It's a type of writing that uses symbolic imagery to infuse historical events coupled with a divine significance. And we first see apocalyptic writing uh, come about when the Israelites are captive in Babylon. And you read those books, they're full of dreams, right? Giant statues made of different metals, giant wheels spinning in the sky. So during the time of Jesus, that form of writing was common. So what does that mean? Well, it means that Christians in the first century could have read Revelation and understood it. But non-Christians, non-Jews could not have. It was a code. It was a way to talk about the story of God without the persecutors knowing what they were saying. Revelation was written around 86 to 95 AD during the time of Emperor Domitian. Emperor Domitian was persecuting Christians and he was a deeply paranoid ruler. He was cruel, power-wielding, ruthless. He purged the Senate. He set many philosophers into exile, and he even arranged for the murder of a Roman priestess by burying her alive. He insisted that he be addressed as master and God. He held games every four years, as the Greeks did, and he would attend those games wearing Greek dress and a golden crown. And his fellow judges also had to wear crowns, and on their crowns were images of other gods and himself. Domitian was a bad dude. So John chose to use this same code to write to churches who were also being persecuted at that time. And at the start of Revelation, you have seven specific letters to seven specific churches. Churches that have real needs. Churches who need help, and they need encouragement during this time. Ephesus, 
the church we're going to read about in chapter 2, was at the very heart of this persecution. They were ground zero. They were a church who was at odds with a corrupt government and a godless culture. I wish it didn't sound familiar, but it does. Jesus says in Revelation 2, verse 5, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. That does not sound good. The first picture of the church that we get in Revelation is that the church is a lampstand. Okay? Now, the word lampstand is code for church. You or I, we might use the word lighthouse. In John's vision, he hears a voice, and he turns, and he says, I see one like the Son of Man. And in that phrase, John is using the same code for Jesus that Daniel uses. And then he says, the one like the Son of Man is walking in between the seven lampstands. So the Son of Man is walking in between the seven lampstands. Code for Jesus is moving amongst his churches. And what can we learn from this picture? Well, it's a warning. He says, I'll remove your lampstand. In other words, your church will, won't be a church anymore. It'll be gone. It's kind of like your dad when he was driving the car on vacation and he had to turn and yell back into the back seat, you and your sister better stop fighting or I'll turn this car around, which means vacation would be over. Jesus says, repent or your church is over. Have you ever visited a church and just not felt the presence of God there? Have you ever visited a church and it wasn't a church anymore? It was a museum? It was a tourist spot? Jesus says, you better change or all of this will be over. This is the worst thing for a church to hear. I'll remove your lampstand. The church is supposed to be light. John 1.5 says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Psalm 119 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Jesus says in Matthew, in the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Clearly, the Bible says we are called to be light. We are called to be light, which means if we're effective, if we're burning, if we're bright, if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, we will overpower darkness. Light easily conquers darkness. The Bible says in Philippians that Christ wants us to be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Again, the Bible says in Matthew, you are the light of the world. The the church is supposed to shine. The church is supposed to be different. In a crooked world, in a perverse world, we are supposed to shine. Unfortunately, sometimes it's hard to see a difference between the church and the world. Sometimes churches can be selfish. Sometimes churches can be inward focused. Sometimes they can look just like a business. They can act secular. Light is supposed to be influencing. We are called to be influencing. We are called to penetrate the darkness. We are are there and we are in the world because there is a mission. There are There are lost people at stake. Our neighbors, our friends, our families need us to step up to what God is calling us to do and to make a difference in the world. And just because we burn bright at one time doesn't necessarily mean that we always will. And so what we have to do is we have to make sure that we are burning bright that our churches are burning bright. So what do we have to do to make sure that God doesn't remove our lampstand? Because this passage just said that's possible. And it's not only possible, Ephesus is close to actually having it happen. Why? What did they do? Why are they bad? What's going on? Where did they mess up? Well, let's, let's go back up the page just a little bit to verse two. It says, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. That's a good thing, right? Those are good things. Those are compliments. 
Jesus says they're hard workers and they're patient. They're not quitters. And Jesus says those things as a compliment. So those things matter to Jesus and to churches. And I would hope that Jesus would say those things about any good church, our church, right? Hey, you've worked hard. You stuck with it. You are faithful. You are hardworking day after day, month after month. You're in there. This is what keeps their lampstand burning bright. Jesus says more good things in verse 2. I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. Jesus says that they were loyal, faithful to the cause. The church stood in the pathway of secularism and lies, and they didn't waver. They, they held their ground. And they, they tested falsehood. They tested fake news. You know, right now, your neighbor's churches are breaking up. Entire denominations are splitting up because there are people who are no longer loyal to certain traditions and doctrine. There are bishops who no longer believe Jesus was born of a virgin birth. There are elders who no longer believe that Jesus is the only path to heaven. There are leaders in the church who have admitted sinful lives and they are now excusing it by saying that the Bible's rules are outdated. To burn brightly, to be a lampstand, we have to resist the darkness. It's a challenge. It takes effort, I know. And the church in Ephesus, they are doing those things. In fact, the church in Ephesus, what, they got an entire book in the Bible, right? The book of Ephesians. They have an entire book named after them. And this is the same church that Paul writes to in Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Why would you tell a church to put on the whole armor of God? Because only the full armor of God is going to save them because they're being attacked by the devil. This is the same church that Timothy was pastor of. And Paul wrote personal letters to Timothy and said, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. He says, But avoid a reverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. Clearly, this church was under attack. You know, back then, the emperors demanded to be worshipped as gods. Augustus had two temples in Ephesus. Domitian named Ephesus the guardian of the imperial cult. And Nero, the number 666, was Hebrew code for Nero's name. 666 is the numerical equivalent of the name and title Nero Caesar in Aramaic. Most theologians believe Nero is the prototype for the Antichrist. And the Ephesians fought for biblical loyalty in all of that. And they were faithful and they didn't give up. The text says, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Again, they're patient. They're fighting the good fight. And nobody has thrown in the towel. That's more than we could say about most churches today because really nobody is threatening to kill us, right? It's still legal to be a Christian today. And all of those things, they sound like great things. We should all be a church like Ephesus. And yet Jesus is threatening to take their lampstand away. What could they possibly be doing wrong? Verse 4 says, but I have this against you. That's the worst thing that you would hear somebody you love say. I mean, what's the worst thing your parents could ever say to you? Was, we are so disappointed in you. It cuts to the heart. It makes your stomach sink. Jesus says, but I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Jesus says, you used to be in love. You know, amidst all the legalism and the work that the church in Ephesus was doing, all of us, all churches, we can't afford to miss this warning. The lamp is in danger of going out. 
not from lack of work, but from lack of love. The lampstand burns the brightest with love. Not duty, not diligence, not legalism, not doctrine, not judgment. How can you, as a church, perform the righteous acts of Jesus? How can you model the actions of the Son of God without love? As a church, we are called to be light. We are called to be love. Christ summarizes the best way he can to be that light. When he discusses uh, this topic with a lawyer, the lawyer asks him, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. You know, I'm sure a lot of people uh, forget history, right? Especially our own, especially American history. But in the late 1700s, many people in the United States had stopped going to church. Why? Well, some people believed that the church didn't really play an important role in their life. They didn't need it. And the thought was that, you know, God doesn't care if you go to church. God only cares how you live. On the other side, there was a group of people who were just busy and they were focused on work and earning a living and they didn't have time to worship God. And as a result, church attendance declined dramatically. And so what churches decided to do was sponsor religious revivals. And these revivals stressed our dependence on God. Most of these revivals occurred as camp meetings. People would spend several days hearing the word of God from various preachers, and the revivals allowed people to hear the word of God, but it also provided poor families an opportunity to talk and to trade with one another. And those revivals encouraged people to return to God. And they did. Historically, this is called the Second Great Awakening. Many people in the U.S. became convinced and to more actively dedicate their lives to God and to live in a godly manner. And as a result, church attendance greatly increased during the first half of the 19th century, and a desire to reform the United States arose out of the Second Great Awakening. The U.S.'s alcohol and slavery movements were both greatly influenced by this revival, and women's involvement in the revival provided support for the women's rights movements. A time in our nation's history when Christianity was dangerously on the decline turned out to massively grow the Baptist and Methodist church. And in turn, it helped neighborhoods and it helped raise awareness on social issues. Are those days behind us? They don't have to be. You see, if we are ever to accomplish a great evangelistic campaign again, if we are ever to make the church a positive influence in the world again, it'll only happen because the church has fallen back in love with God and back in love with their neighbors. Christ told the church of Ephesus, you have left your first love. They had some good characteristics. They could recognize what was good and what was evil, but without love, they were still in danger of dying. You see, in God's eyes, love is the key factor. Not duty, not law, love. Now, here's an interesting thing that God says to the church in Ephesus. He tells them that if they don't repent, he'll remove the lampstand from them. In other words, God said to the church, all of your works are not going to make a difference in your communities if you don't have love. So we need to return also to love God and to love others. And that is when our neighbors will experience Christ the best. When we are the bride of Christ. Jesus loves his bride. And so to encourage them, he said, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. What happens when you can't find your keys? 
someone will ask you, where did you last see them? When do you last remember having them, right? Well, if you've lost your first love, Jesus says, think back to when you were in love. When was that? When were you in love with Jesus? When were you more in love with your neighbors? Can you remember the time before you were bitter? When do you remember being in love and on fire for God? Was it in elementary school? Was it high school? Was it when you first got married? When did you love God more than you do now? When did you love your neighbors more than you do now? You know, whenever we talk about church growth, we always mean people sitting in chairs. But Jesus wants us to be growing more in love. We don't need more wisdom in the world. The world is not lacking in knowledge. And we're all, we're all pretty woke. The only thing that'll save the church is the only thing that'll save the world. And it's love. We should love God more. We should love people more. Jesus is pleading with his, bro- his bride, don't die. Don't die. Reclaim the love that you once had by doing the things that you once did. Repent and do the works you did at first. So how do you do that? A poet once said, live like you're in love and you will be. When I met my wife, I did everything I could to get her to be attractive to me. Right? I put my best foot forward. I did everything to get her attention. I wanted to win her heart. I wanted her to be attracted to me. I wanted her to love me. The church needs to be in love. And they need to be attractive to the world. After all, Jesus was. Right? Wasn't he? People from all walks of life used to come to him. They went out of their way to be with him. They would spend all day with him. You think people were less busy back then? No. They came from all over and they had no issue going to where he was and being with him. Jesus didn't spend all his days in temples with priests. He spent his time in the world loving people. Haven't you heard that you catch more flies with honey. That means we have to be intentional about our attractiveness. The church needs to put its best foot forward. If we are the body, then we need to look our best. We need to act our best. We need to show a watching world that we love them. Show our neighbors that we love them. Show visitors that come through those doors that we love them. The problem with many churches that I'm seeing today is that instead of loving and being concerned for others, they're too distracted and concerned for themselves. There is no, listen, there is no denomination that is in danger of splitting because they love too much. No, churches and denominations are dying because they don't agree on doctrine. (laughs) We can get so concerned about ourselves and about our doctrine that we become irrelevant to the world. The bottom line is, when the church quits loving, we quit shining. And when we quit being attractive, we become in danger of having our light extinguished. I'm not a really big fan of Revelation. I know people would love us to preach it more. But like I said, it's written in code and it's hard to understand. And when something is hard to understand, it's easy to ignore. And when you ignore something long enough, eventually you forget about it. I don't ever want to see Christ's church described 
as hard to understand. Or that we talk in code. We've got to stop arguing about the small stuff and get back to holding hands with the big stuff. I want to live to see revival break out again in my lifetime. To see people returning to the faith again. To see people returning to Jesus again. And to do that, we need to love again. Let's pray together. Lord, we are reminded that the greatest of these is love. That out of all the word searches and topics that we could discuss and argue about, all the hot button issues that are currently in the news, there is no greater calling for your church than to stand on the side of love. That wherever the line is drawn, the church should be stepping over that line to be on the side of love. Because that is where your son is standing. Your son loved people and he healed people and he fed people and he touched people. And whenever the issue of doctrine was introduced, that was when your son got angry. And he said, you don't have it figured out. You are Israel's teachers. You do not know. Your son came to love, to be the example of love, and he established his church to go out into the world and to love the world. And that is when we grow and serve the best. May your church be a place of healing. May it be a place that feeds. May it be a place that clothes. May it be a place that welcomes the widow and the orphan, the poor, the destitute, the lame, the broken. May we look outward, not inward. May we look upward. Help us to love you more. Help us to love your people more. And may we burn bright. May our lampstand burn bright. Thank you for each one here and for the blessings you give us each and every day. Watch over us now this week and keep us safe. We love you and we thank you. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us once again. Of course, I want to remind you that we're here every single week on Sundays. We have two services on Sunday mornings. We have one at 930 which is our traditional service. We have a choir, and we're going to sing all of your favorite standard hymns. And then at 11 o'clock, we have a contemporary service. Please come as you are. Come, come comfortable. Uh, this is also our family service, where we have a full children's program. We have something for nursery all the way through high school. And you can always find more about us at waldenchurch.com or follow us on our social media. Thanks, guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.